All right, wonderful. I think we're going to, uh, we are going to begin. Uh, I welcome, uh, welcome everyone. Great to see everyone this morning. Wonderful to, uh, to be together, to learn together. And uh, let me just begin with our sponsor. We have a sponsor for the academic year. Le'iloi Nishmas Miriam Bas Avram, Alav Shalom V'Shem Tov Ben Shlomo, Zichrono Livracha. Okay, we have the schus to, uh, to study the words and the teachings of Rav Kook. And uh, what we're going to see today, the teaching that Rav Kook is going to share with us, is, uh, is a teaching that is um, significant today, as significant today as it was when he wrote it 100 years ago, in terms of, uh, in terms of what we're facing here in Israel, and just catching the last few minutes of uh, Rabbi Manning Shear as I was walking in, in terms of the whole issue and the debate and some of the tension around um, the religious community, the Haredi community, and the, uh, the secular community on issue of army and other issues. So this is something that Rav Kook, even though we do not have the state of Israel yet in the day of Rav Kook, in the time of Rav Kook, but this is something that he is already sensitive to and something that he speaks a lot about in terms of how to create a, uh, a sense of unity and uh, love and, um, and friendship and covered for one another. So this is going to be our topic today. And, um, and we're going to see actual, actually something very interesting in terms of the influences of Rav Kook and where, where his ideas stem from, where he is inspired to bring his, uh, his unique teaching to Am Yisrael. So we are on page one. And um, I, I put on the left side of the page at the very top the title page of Actually, the Sefer that we've been studying, this book that we've been studying, which is a collection of teachings of Rav Kook, it's called Eretz Chefetz, which means a land of, uh, of yearning, of love. It's compiled by Rabbi Yishaya Shapiro. You see that towards the bottom of uh, that section, the, uh, the left-hand side. And he is the brother of the Eish Kodesh, of the Piazetz Rebbe. He comes to Eretz Yisrael in 1920. He meets Rav Kook. And he begins to, um, to compile teachings of Rav Kook in this sefer called Eretz Chefet. So that's the title page. And now on the right side of the page is, if you look at the very top, it says Perik Yud. It's the 10th chapter of the sefer that we're studying. Those that have been with us for the last uh, year and a half, we've been studying the sefer from the very beginning. And uh, proud to say that we're already, we've made it to the, uh, the 10th chapter of the sefer. It's 12 chapters, so I'm hoping that by the end of the year, by the end of the summer, that we'll complete, uh, complete this Sefer. So here we are in chapter 10, Perig Yud. The name of the chapter is Avot Dubanim. That's the name that the, uh, Rav Yishai Shapiro gives to this chapter, which means fathers and children. Or I think what he's referring to is uh, the older generation and the new generation. Right? Those that were the traditionalists that were living in the land of Israel and those that were those that were coming to the land of Israel that were not necessarily part of the religious community, many of them that were not on board in terms of, uh, in terms of religious practice and, and Jewish life in a traditional sense. So let's now see the words of Rav Kook, two short pieces, and they're essentially just a, uh, just a sentence or two. Sentence number one, piece number one, Aleph. Hatchiya shel hashavad levavot al banim v'lev banim al avotav. So hatchiya, hatchiya means the revitalization, coming back to life of hashavat levavot, that the father's hearts will return to the children, the children to the fathers. That's a pasuk that's found in Malachi. We're actually going to be reading that pasuk very shortly as part of Shabbos HaGadol. And uh, the vision, the prophecy of Malachi is that a time is going to come that the parents and children, even though they are on different pages, that there's the generation gap between them, that there's going to be a, a love again, there's going to be a reunification of, uh, of fathers and children, children's and uh, children and fathers. So he says, Hatchiya, this revitalization, that this is coming to life, Ef Sharliot, it's not possible, Kiim Davka Al Yedei Avira to Eret Yisrael. That this is going to come, ag- come about, it's going to come to fruition only in the land of Israel, and in particular, it's going to happen with Avira to Eretz Yisrael. As I was walking here today, walking to the, to the OU, the, the beautiful Avira, the Avir of Eretz Yisrael. But here he's not just talking about the beautiful temperature and uh, the outdoors, 
but he's talking about a spiritual avira, that there's something about the, the spiritual nature of just the air of Israel, of living in the land of Israel. And we know that he's referring to the uh, avira de arad machim. But here he talks about that somehow the land of Israel has within its spiritual content in the, uh, the makeup of the spiritual air, that it brings about a unity, it brings about a oneness in Am Yisrael. Okay, we can all ask the question, well, where, where is that exactly? Is that happening? But that's the, uh, that's the argument that Rav Kook is making, that only in the land of Israel that this is going to happen, it's going to come to fruition. That is statement number one, and we'll analyze that statement. What is it about Israel that, uh, that brings about that unity, that brotherhood, that oneness? And now the second piece from Rav Kook. The second piece from Rav Kook in Perek Yud, Bet. Knesset Yisrael hit na'ara litchia. Knesset Yisrael, the Jewish people as a whole, hit na'ara, has been awakened litchia to a, to a revitalization, to a, to a renewal, like tchiyat ha-metim. B'yachas l'ratzon shel hador ha-tsair. And here he says something which is really fascinating. And he puts it out there, he makes the statement, how did it happen? How did we, how did it come to life again, this, this love for the land of Israel and the return to the land of Israel? B'yachas l'ratzon, it came through the will of the Hador Hatsair. It's come through the young generation. It's not the older generation and not the, and again, really referring to his day, the religious community, those elders, it's not through them. They have not inspired the return to the land of Israel. How has it happened? Through young people, a young generation. Those are the facts. Right? The facts is that they are the ones that have, that, that, that have come back to the land of Israel, this resurgence, this revitalization, this renewal of the love for the land of Israel. It's happened through the Dor Hatsair. Next line, HaKochot nit oreru beteoran nifla'a umit ma'amat. And it has happened in a, this awakening has happened in, a, in an awesome way. Nifla'a umat mahat. Timiha. Timiha means it's a wonder, almost miraculously, how this has happened, how the young people, the younger generation, have brought about this uh, renewal. Ein bishum ofen efsharut lahachni'am beder kivisha. We are not to try to, uh, to overcome or to kind of suppress those feelings, right, and that, that yearning for the land of Israel that they have awakened the entire nation to. And there are those in the Jewish community at that time that were saying, let's distance ourselves from them and, and, and that we're not to be inspired by them. Rav Kook says, no, we are to be inspired by an awakening that's coming from that generation, this younger generation. But what, what are we to do? Ki'im l'romamam u'lesagvam. But we are to lift them up, le romain, le sagvam. We are to take that generation and those individuals and that community and to uplift them, to show them and to share with them, to say to them how beautiful it is what you're doing and also to share with them and to show them that what you're doing is, is our dream, right? We're sharing that dream together, returning to the land of Israel. That's a dream of, of Avram, Yitzhak and Yaakov. That's the promise of, of God to the Jewish people. It's the story of Moshe taking the Jewish people out of Egypt and, and with the dream of coming to the land of Israel. So it's a movement, it's a movement of secular Jews, but it's a movement in which we are to have the greatest respect for. And again, our part, they're the ones that are leading the way, but our part is now to share with them how great it is what they are accomplishing and to show them also the spiritual, the religious aspect of that. Ulahar <speaking in Hebrew> Odlifnehem, the last line of Rav Kook, Ulahar <speaking in Hebrew> Odlifnehem, and we are to show them the light in what they are doing. Harome Mavadira, this awesome, the awesome light and the elevated light that is that that's contained in their actions in what they're doing in terms of of bringing the Jewish people back to the land of Israel. So this is really classic. You know, this is classic Rav Cook. Classic, I would say, Rav Cook 101. In terms of the great respect that he has, the awesome respect that he has for the young generation, even though they're not a generation that are religious people necessarily, but he sees in them, he sees in them the goodness, and it's our role, it's our role to show them and to share with them the greatness of their actions, and, and in that way to bring them, to bring them closer to a, a religious life, to a traditional life. And one of the things that Rav Kook is trying to do throughout his lifetime is to, is to bridge that gap. 
is to take the community that is the, quote unquote, the, the Haredi community, the Yishuv Hayashan, right, those that have settled here, those that are living here in Yerushalayim and throughout the country, the, the religious Jews that have been here and keeping a religious way of life for, for, for such a long time and to, to, to kind of create a, a, a bond and, and a brotherhood and, and a respect for one another. And again, that's what I prefaced the, uh, the shir earlier. This is something that we're, that we're struggling with today as well. We, we may have differences, but how do we bring about that, that respect for one another and to see the goodness in one another? So this idea of Rav Cook, the importance of, of kind of creating this harmony and this oneness, I would ask the question, where does Rav Cook and where does Rav Cook get this from? Where does he learn? Where does he learn this idea? And it's interesting. You would, you, we would think that this is just—it's sort of obvious. Is, is this not the the way of the Torah? Doesn't doesn't everyone believe in this? Like this isn't this every rabbi? But as we all know, it's it's not every rabbi and it's not every community that's that's emphasizing this point, emphasizing this idea. So what I want to look at for a few minutes is is to think about where does Rav Cook see this idea, where is he inspired by this idea? And uh, there are two rabbis that I, um, that I want to highlight in terms of the, the life of Rav Kook, where I believe that Rav Kook is inspired by their teachings in, in particular. One is the Chafetz Chaim, the Chafetz Chaim. And uh, not everyone is aware of this, but Rav Kook studies with the, the, with the Chafetz Chaim, that he's a Chavrusa with the Chafetz Chaim. Again, we think about the Chafetz Chaim in like one world and Rav Kook is in another world. They're close friends with one another. Not only are they close friends, they're both Kohanim. And they share, they share that uh, commonality. And they're very proud that they're both Kohanim. And they begin to study together the laws of, of being a Kohen. Not only you know, technically what the laws are, but, but practically. That they're both anticipating the possibility of the Beit HaMikdash. And they believe that we're getting closer and closer the Chavetz Chaim writes about it as well, that we're moving into Atchalta de Geula. Not only Rav Kook, the Chavetz Chaim writes that as well, that he believes that we're moving into a period that we're getting closer to the time of Mashiach. And they begin to study together the laws of what it means to be a Kohen. We're reading those parashiot right now. And not just theoretical, but, you know, but how to do it, that, they're, that tomorrow morning, if there's a Beis HaMikdash, we're going to, you know, we're going to have to function as the Kohanim. There's actually a beautiful sefer called uh, Shnei Kohanim Gedolim, the two Kohanim Gedolim, and it's about the Chavetz Chaim and Rav Kook and about their relationship with one another, the learning that they do with one another. It's interesting that the Chavetz Chaim told Rav Kook that I do not want you to continue learning. They're learning together, meaning learning in a kolel. And he says, I see that you have the, you have the, uh, the kochos, that you have the ability to be a great leader in Am Yisrael. And Rav Kook doesn't want to stop learning. He wants to, like many you know, people, wants to just sit and continue his, his mystical learning, his writings. And the Chavetz Chaim says, you have to stop. You have to become a pulpit rabbi. And that's what he does. He becomes a pulpit rabbi and eventually becomes a pulpit rabbi. He comes to Israel and in Haifa, I'm sorry, in Yafo, he, <coughs> he becomes uh, the rabbi until he eventually makes it to, uh, to Yushalayim. So they study together. And uh, Rav Kook is very much influenced by, by the Chavetz Chaim. I want to share with you the following from the Chavetz Chaim. By the way, one of the things that's probably most well known about the Chavetz Chaim is the idea of Lashon Hara. Right? That's his, he becomes known by that name, the Chavetz Chaim, based on the Sefer that he writes. And that sensitivity that he has in terms of Lashon Hara, in terms of not speaking negative about one another. And here, the Chavetz Chaim, with all the knowledge that he has, and he's the great, one of the greatest, you know, gedolim of certainly of the last hundreds of years, that he devotes a lot of his writing to that topic. And think about that for a moment: that he's devoting writing and his teaching to the idea of ben adam lechaveru, in terms of how we are to respect one another, the sensitivity that we are to have for one another. And he senses that there isn't that kind of sensitivity that's needed. And he writes Svarim just about that topic, about Chesed and about Lashon Hara. One of those books is called Shmirat HaLashon. So he has the Chavetz Chaim. He has another Savior called Shmirat HaLashon, which is guarding, guarding one's tongue. And he writes the following. And this is the bottom of page one. Yesh lo le'adam hitazer le'hitazer bekol kocho la'asot shalom ben hatzdadim. So he writes the following. And again, this, I believe, is... 
you could kind of you know, capture the, the life of Rav Kook to some degree in this one line of the Chavetz Chaim. And I'm sure they, they shared this idea together and they studied this idea and they, not only were they Kohanim, but they also, were, they also believed in, in this idea of what it means to be a Kohen, to be a person who loves peace. So the Chavetz Chaim writes, Yesh lo le'adam lehitazer, they to put in all of your effort, bekol kocho, with all of your strength, la'asot shalom ben atzadim. You have to be a peacemaker. A person is to be a peacemaker. How to bring peace between individuals. Velo yitatzel baza, you shouldn't be lazy about this. Afilu hu achashu shav Yisrael. Even if you're an important figure, this is something that you need to be involved with as well. Right, somebody in the community that's not getting along, family members not getting along, right? you're, you're not supposed to uh, ignore that, that. You're supposed to do everything that you can to be a part of that, to make peace. Interesting, if I were to ask you, who is the peacemaker of the Torah? Who is the model of being a peacemaker? So everyone says Aaron, and you're probably right, it is Aaron. But the Gemara doesn't bring Aaron as the example the example that the Gemara brings, we'll see it inside in a moment, is that Moshe is the peacemaker. He represents a person of peace. And, who, and how do we see that? The story of Parshas Korach. And he goes to Datan Aviram. Even though they're making trouble, he goes to their door. He knocks on their door and says, let's try to, let's try to work things out. I know, we're, you know, I know we're having a hard time, and you're having a hard time with me, but let's see if there's a way we can work things out. The Amru Razal and our rabbis teach us, this is the Gemara in Sanhedrin, Mikan She'ein Makzikim B'Machlokas, that you should not hold on to Machlokas. And that's always a problem with Machlokas, right? Holding on to Machlokas, right? All the stories in shuls where people aren't talking and they ask why and they, they no longer remember, right? Rabbi, it's like years later, I don't remember why I don't talk to this guy any longer, but I, but I know that I don't talk to him. That's, what's that? And generations, that's right. We, some, it passes down, unfortunately. So that's what the Gemara, that's what the Gemara says. Ein magzikin mikan she'en magzikin b'machlokas. Now, by the way, I'll just show you the Gemara that he's quoting. This is the Gemara in Sanhedrin. It's Kuf Yud Amud Aleph, above. And right in the middle, right in the middle of that paragraph, it, uh, right in the middle of the paragraph, the middle of the line, it says, Vayaka Moshe vayelech el dasan v'aviram. Ama reish lakish, says reish lakish. And remember that name, Reish Lakish, for a moment. We'll come back to that. Amar Reish Lakish, Mikan she'e machzikim b'machlokas. This is the source in the Torah that you're not allowed to hold on to machlokas. To Amar Rav, kol ha-machzik b'machlokas over belav. It's one of the lavin. It's one of the 613 commandments of the Torah. Not everyone knows that. It's one of the 613, is not to hold on, not to be involved in machlokas. Shnemar, the lo yiyek korach the adaso, that you are not to, and that's a that's understood in the Gemara as a as a mitzvah, or as a transgression. One of the six thirteen, when the lav and the Torah. So that is um, so that is the the, the Chavetz Chaim. Let's read a few more words in the Chavetz Chaim. The Chavetz Chaim writes the Shemira Salasha, and again this tradition. Where does Rav Cook? Where does where is he inspired by this idea and this and this derech? I would say certainly one of the influences is, is the Chafetz Chaim on the life of Rav Kook. We'll read a few more lines. For Isa ben Midrash, it says the following in the Medrash, Lefi shahalach Moshe lepischo shel dasan ve'aviram, says the Medrash, because he went to the door, he knocked on the door of dasan ve'aviram, zacha lahatzil arba tzadikim mepischo shel gehenim. He saved four people from the door of Gehenim. Now, what does that mean? The Elohen Gimel B'nei Korach, the On Ben Pelas. That there were four people, says the Medrash, that were saved. Now, how were, how were they saved from the Pesach of Gehenim? Because they saw Moshe Rabbeinu, and they saw his kindness, they saw his sensitivity, and they backed out. They backed out of the Machlokas. We know that On Ben Pelas, that he's involved, right? That's the opening psukim of Korach, and somehow he disappears. And we don't know what happens to him. There are different, different interpretations. That's right, very good. So one interpretation is that his wife convinces him to get out of that machlokas. You're absolutely right. But according to this medrash, the medrash says it was when On Ben Pelas saw or heard about that Moshe Rabbeinu took the first step to try to make peace. And what do we know about B'nai Korach? 
So they were involved also, but B'nai Korach become important individuals. Anybody know anything about the B'nai Korach? What? They become, that's right, they become Balei Tshuva, that's what it says, and we have Mizmorim that are Livnei Korach. Beautiful, the, 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 the Tehillim that we say right before Tekiah Shofar, that we say seven times, are the children of Korach that write that Tehillim. So amazing, so according to the Medrash, how were they saved? They were saved because they saw a role model, because they saw Moshe Rabbeinu, they saw a peacemaker, and with that they were inspired to do tshuva. That's what the, uh, the Medrash, what the Chavetz Chaim brings. The Amru Chazal, we'll read just a few more lines, just beautiful. The Amru Chazal, Chazal say based on this, Bakshehu le'ohavcha ve'radfehu im sonacha. So the Pasuk says, or actually I skipped the Pasuk, you see, Bakesh Shalom Veradfeu. So the Pasuk says in Tehillim that one should Bakesh, that one should always be asking for or searching for Shalom Veradfeu, Rodef, and one should always be pursuing, very good, pursuing, running after. So that you have those two words. So the Medr says, the following Chazal say, Amru Chazal, Bakshehu Ohavcha. So you should ask for the one who you love, v'radfehu im so nacha. In other words, it sounds like even somebody that you love, if you had a falling out with, that you should, uh, you should try to make peace, and even your, so, somebody that you hate, that you have to pursue it, bakshehu bimekomcha, v'radfehu bimekomos acherim. You do it locally, you do it even people that are at a distance, bakshehu bigufcha, v'radfehu bimamoncha. You do it in terms of the physical, in terms of mamon, you do it for yourself, you should do it for others as well. Bakshehu hayom, and this is really the last, uh, this last part that I want to highlight. So what is this double lashon of bakesh and rodev? So it says, bakshehu hayom, you should try today, v'radfehu lemachar, and you should search or pursue it lemachar. What does that mean? It says the Chavetz Chaim, v'kavanat midrash v'amesh mefarish v'radfehu lemachar. What does it mean you should pursue it tomorrow. Lomar she'al yitya'eish ha'adam b'da'ato l'achshov shelo yuchal ha'ashlim. You shouldn't think that you can't accomplish it, that you're not going to be able to attain, achieve real peace. Ela yirdof achar ha'shalom hayom v'gam l'machar u'liyom ha'acharin ad sheyagi'ehu. So you keep doing it again and again and again. You never give up. And, um, and I think Rav Kook, Rav Kook believed that as well. Rav Kook believed that um, even if we don't see it right away, even if it's not immediate, that doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. It doesn't mean that it's not going to happen in the next generation. If it doesn't happen now, it can happen, it can happen in the next generation as well. Okay. So I said before that I wanted you to remember the, um, the name Reish Lakish. So Reish Lakish is the one that makes the statement in the Gemara, the, the, and he makes that statement that based on the, uh, the episode of, of Moshe, Vayaka Moshe, Vayelech el Dasam Vaviram, Amoresh Lakesh, Mikan She'ein Machzikim Bimach Lokes, that we learn from here, and Moshe Rabbeinu becomes a model of not holding on to a machlokes, arguments. So go to page two. And I'm not going to read through the Gemara. This is actually, it's, it's really worthwhile to read through. I would say that this Gemara may be one of the most... Um, upsetting Gemaras in the entire Shas. I would argue, I, I don't know if I've seen a Gemara that's more upsetting than, uh, than this Gemara. Almost difficult to, to share it on some level. But it's uh, a story of Reish Lakish, and it's a story of Reish Lakish with Rabbi Yochanan. They are chavrusas with one another. For those that remember the story, this is in Baba Metzia, Pei Dalet Amad Aleph. The Gemara begins to talk about the, uh, the earlier part of the story where Reish Lakish is not a religious man. According to Tosos, he is religious and then he leaves religion. And the two of them are, are, in, the, uh, are in a river that they're swimming together. And Rabbi Yochanan sees Reish Lakish and he, and he says, actually, Reish Lakish comes to the back of Rabbi Yochanan and he thinks Rabbi Yochanan is a woman and he's... Uh, about to approach what he thinks is a woman, and, and he turns around, and it's, it's Rabbi Yochanan. It's a rabbi. Again, Reish Lakish is not a, not a religious man at this point. And he says to him that, uh, I see that you're a man of great strength, and I think you should put your strength, you should put your powers into the study of Torah. And he convinces him to return to a Jewish life, and he begins to study with him. 
and they become chavrusas with one another. He says at that time, you can marry my sister. I have a sister that's more beautiful than I am, and you can marry my sister. And they become lifelong chavrusas with one another. And all the arguments in the Gemara, the beautiful arguments on so many pages of the Gemara of Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish, so you have their family with one another, a brother-in-law, and they become the closest of friends. The Gemara then tells the following story. There's one day that they're in the base Medrash and they're discussing a, uh, an issue of, again, technicalities of around Tuma and in terms of weapons. And at what point does a weapon, does a knife, does a sword become Tame? It, when does it become a, a, a utensil, so to speak? And at that point, Rabbi Yochanan says to Reish Lakish, this is something that you probably know a lot about because you were a thief, you were a bandit, and you probably know more about this than I do. And Reish Lakish is offended by that, by that line, which by the way is very problematic because we actually have al that you're not supposed to remind the Balchuva of something that they were involved in in the past. But he says that for, for whatever reason, Rabbi Yochanan says that, and at that point, Reish Lakish says to Rabbi Yochanan, he says, I'm not sure why you brought me back to the base Medrash. He says, I was a rav. He says, I was a leader amongst the bandits in my, in my chevra. And here I'm a leader also, but, but I see that there's really no difference between, between the two. And it seems that both offend one another. What they say to one another is offensive. And at that point, they, they no longer speak to one another. They no longer are chavrusas. Not only are they not chavrusas, says the Gemara, but they no longer are talking to one another. And the Gemara then says, again, you can, you can look at it, you can read it inside um, later, but Reish Lakesh at that point, the Gemara says he passes away, that he dies, and he dies knowing, or maybe out of heartache, that he, that he lost this relationship with Rabbi Yochanan. And then the Gemara says, Rabbi Yochanan also, that he passes away, and without ever making up, and also with a great pain that, they, that there was a, a fracture in that relationship. This is the Gemara, and that's how the Gemara ends. I was actually looking over the last couple of weeks for, for some mafarshim and ways to kind of, you know, to kind of look at a more positive side, <laughs> like to see like a little bit more. I haven't found anything. I haven't, you can, you can do research yourself if anybody finds anything, but to kind of see more of a positive light. I didn't find anywhere that kind of interpret this in a more, in a positive light. It seems that there is this, th this happened and uh, in a very, very unfortunate story in the Gemara. And when I read that line of Reish Lakish in Sanhedrin, I thought, I thought about this Gemara. Reish Lakish is the one who says how careful we have to be not to be machzik de machlokas, how dangerous that is, how terrible that is to hold on to machlokas. And that's Reish Lakish. I don't know when he made that statement. You never know in the Gemara when that statement was made. Was it made possibly after this incident where he himself, that he experienced machlokas and what, what it did to him, what it did in terms of family and his relationship. So this, uh, again, this is an influence, an important influence in terms of where Rav Kook and ideas from the Gemara itself and from the Chafetz Chaim, what it means for the Jewish people not to hold on to machlokas. So we have to find a way. And this Rav Kook comes along and says, I see this generation, the young generation, and they're coming back. Let's see the good in them. Let's build them up. Let's have a relationship of love, and that's what we need for Am Yisrael. Did you want to make a comment, so please? As, as tragic as that is, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The positive of it is that they were both looked like they had Kalakma, and that they were, they felt bad about it, but somehow they didn't get to It's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. It's a good point. It's a good point. Even though if you look at the Gemara, they tried to convince Rabbi Yochanan to forgive him, and he's, and he's unwilling to do so. So, I don't, I, so there's a, it's, it's, it's very, very, very difficult. Um, it's difficult. It's a difficult, difficult story. It's not a story that, has anybody heard that story before? It's not like the usual, like, Divrei Torah that we give at Chalashudis, you know, with the, the, the Reish Lakish of Yochanan falling out. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not pleasant. Of the, the two Gedolei Ador, imagine Art Scroll, you know, reading about Gedolei Ador that, you know, they ended their life not speaking to one another. We, we you know, we don't know of it. Amazing that, yeah, well, the bar comes, yes, okay. Um, What's amazing, by the way, I'll take one positive, and that is the Gemara is sharing it. The Gemara is honest about sharing. Does, does the Gemara have to include the story? Does Rav Ashi and Ravina, who are editing the Gemara, need to include this? No. That, that definitely not. So that's 
Definitely not. What? It's a lesson. That, exactly. They want, it's a lesson. It's a lesson as hard as it is to hear it and how unfor as unfortunate as it is. And to talk about gedolim that have this kind of falling out, we're going to, it's going to be on the page of the Gemara. It's going to be open to everyone to read. Yes. They were both grieved. That's, yes. Exactly right. Exactly right. Okay. So we have the, uh, so this is, I, Rav Cook is coming from, from this world. He's coming from this, this sensitivity in terms of how dangerous that it's a love, that's an Isser in the Torah, that the Chavetz Chaim speaks about how terrible it is for there to be machlokes. Yes, we are disagreeing with one another. There's a religious community. There's a secular community. But, but how do we do it? How do we do it appropriately? Another influence. Yes, please. They, yeah, there is, yeah. I don't know if they did it publicly, but there is. Yes, you're right. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I, I, as I said, I, I was like searching for some commentary that kind of like, you know, shed some positivity on it. I, I haven't come across anything. It's a very, very difficult, it's an extreme, as I, as I said, it's almost like to share it. I, I, it's like, uh, it's, it's hard to even share this Gemara. It's hard to share it, but it's, uh, it's here, and um, you can read it. And, but this is Reish Lakish, and this is Reish Lakish who teaches. He's the one that then teaches that, that lesson. So let's come back now to Rav Cook in terms of his, his influences. So he's impacted by the Chavetz Chaim. Again, beautiful to think about the Rav Cook and the Chavetz Chaim. Just think about them sitting in a, in a Chavrusa together, their friendship. There's another personality very important in the life of Rav Cook. He doesn't ever meet Rav Nachman of Breslov. But Rav Nachman of Breslov is also a very, very important person in the life of Rav Kook. We know that he, um, that he studied the works of Likutei Moran. We know that he had what's called Likutei Tfilos, which are the prayers of Rav Nassim. It was on his shtender that he would use those tfilot on a regular basis, on a weekly basis. And he once said, he once said that I feel that I am a neshama, that I have the neshama of Rav Nachman of Breslov. That's what Rav Kook, uh, Rav Kook said. So, one of the very beautiful parts of the teachings of Rav Nachman of Breslov is um, the love that we are to have for one another and to see the best in one another. This is like classic Hasidus, but Rav Nachman of Breslov is one, one of the great personalities who's teaching this idea. I wanted to share with you one, one source, and it's actually a, I, I would say it's one of the most famous teachings of Rav Nachman of Breslov. It's known as a Zamra. It's from his Likute Moran. And uh, you see it on the bottom of page Reish, I'm sorry, the bottom of page two. It's Reish Pei Beis. And these are the words of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. So let's just, we'll read a few, uh, yeah, free, let's read a few lines together. So it begins with the word Da. Da ki tzarich ladune kol adam lekafskos. So he says, you have to know. And when he, where Rabbi Nachman of Breslov says Da, doesn't just mean, what does Da mean? No. No. <laughs> what does it mean? It means really know it. This is something you gotta. This is something you gotta really know, right? We talk about das, by the way, and das. Where's the first time that we have das in the Torah? What? What's the first time of das in the Torah? What? Adam and Chava. They knew one another. Intimacy. You gotta know this intimately. You have to know this. It has to be. It has to be at your core. It has to be at your heart and soul. You have to judge everybody favorably. Even somebody who's an absolute rasha. Find that little bit of good in every person. Because that little good of that person, so he's no longer a rasha. Finding that little good in every person. And if you then judge that person favorably, then you actually do lift him up to be that, to be, to be a tzaddik, to be a good person. The way that you view that person, once you view him that way, once you treat him that way, so that person's going to be inspired by that. That person may even change. If you, if you show a love to that person, if that's how you relate to that person, you see him as a tzaddik, right? you see him as a holy brother, as Shlomo Karlbach would say to everyone that he would meet, Holy brother, how you doing? 
all of a sudden he's saying holy brother to me, so I, already, I feel like a little bit holy. Okay, he believes that I'm holy? Okay, maybe I am holy. So this is what Rav Nachman of Breslov teaches. He teaches to see that ma'at, and once you do, and once you begin to internalize that, and you treat the person that way, so then you're going to make, uh, it's going to make an impact. And this is where Rav Kook is also He's taking this very beautiful Hasidic idea, the emphasis on, on seeing the best in others, even the Russia to find, to find within the Russia. By the way, that's not so simple to say, because many sources say once it's a Russia, it's a Russia. Right? We're going to read in the Seder in a few weeks. Russia, how do we respond to the Russia? doesn't sound like we're looking for his, his Pintal Yid. We're, we're, so the, the Agada actually doesn't take that approach to the Russia. The, Russia sa- the Agada says you gotta, got to, you know, You've got to respond in appropriately to the Russia. But that's not what Rav Nachman says, not what Rav Kook says. Rav Kook says, find the love, right? Find the goodness in the other, right? Create that, find a way to create harmony and uh, bring out the best in one another. And uh, here we have one other very important influence in the life of, uh, of Rav Kook. And we turn to page three now. And uh, so we have the Chavetz Chaim, we have Rav Nachman of Breslov, and we also have... Chabad. We have the teachings of Chabad. Rav Kook comes from a family of, uh, of Chabad. Actually, his father is not a Chabadnik. He studied in the Velaz and Yeshiva. And they say about the parents of uh, Rav Kook that they, it was a mixed marriage, a mixed marriage in the sense <laughs> that his mother came from Chabad, a very close student of, uh, of the Tzemach Tzedek, the third Rebbe of Chabad. So he comes from, and it's interesting that that's actually who he becomes in his life, that he becomes this synthesis of great learning of Velazhin and the learning of, of Hasidus. That's what, he, that's what he synthesizes and incorporates in his personality. And those were her, his parents. So that's also not coincidental in terms of the impact. Um, his mother, when he was a, a little baby, she knitted a yarmulke. A, uh, we all know what a yarmulke is. I think kids today would know what a yarmulke is. Do I have to translate what a yarmulke is? A kippah. A kippah, and it was a kippah that was made from the threads and a button of the kapata of the Tzemach Tzedek, of the third Rebbe of, of Chabad. So we see in terms, of, in terms of the family and the closeness to Chabad, and the Chabad teachings come through in terms of the life of Rukuk. So here on the top of page three, I want to share with you the following, which is really interesting. This is what Rabbi Nachem Mendel Schneerson, we all know, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the very first time that he becomes, the, as he speaks, the first message that he gives as the Rebbe of Chabad at 770 in Crown Heights. Has anybody been there, 770 Crown Heights? You got a dollar, beautiful, hold on to that. Or you can make a lot of money, you could put it on eBay if you like. Um, so this is 1951, January 17, 1951. This is the first time that Rabbi Nachem Mendel Schneerson speaks as the Rebbe of Chabad, as the new Rebbe of Chabad. And it says the following. And this is, a, I guess, a description and a little bit of what he said. Second paragraph. Upon his arrival in America, the Rebbe quoted the Midrash. When you come to a city, do as its custom. That's what the Midrash says. You have to follow the custom of the place that you're in. Here in America, people like to hear things expressed in a form of a statement, preferably a provocative and shocking statement. I don't know. He said, that's the way of America. You've got to put out, maybe it's true today also, like a one-liner, you know, one something that's going to, be, going to be memorable. I don't know if this is how it should be done, but when you come to a city, do as it's custom. That's what the Rebbe said. So I'm, gonna, just gonna, 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 I'm going to give one line a one-liner to kind of uh, to capture what it is, what Hasidus is all about. A statement then, the three loves, love of God, love of Torah, and love of one's fellow are one. One cannot differentiate between them, <clears throat> for they are all one of a single essence. And then he quoted the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov quotes the early sages, when you grasp the part of an essence, you grasp it all. Since the three loves are of a single essence, each one embodies all three. Okay, there's a lot to say about this, but what I want to highlight from this statement is something very simple, and that is, what is Hasidus? What is Hasidus according to the Baal Shem Tov? There are three principles of Hasidus. Loving God, loving God a lot, by the way, a lot. Devekas, that you feel the presence of God, that you really love God. 
loving God, loving Torah. You got to love the Torah and loving your fellow man, loving your fellow Jew. So that, that's, that's, that's Chabad, that's Hasidus. That's what the Baal Shem Tov said is unique, is unique to the Hasidic way of life. So um, actually they talk about, they talk about the Rav Kook, that he believed in those three, those three loves, and he added one more love. He said that a Jew must have those three loves and one more love a Jew must have. According to Rav Kook, what's that? Love of Eretz Yisrael. Love of Eretz Yisrael. That was missing, he said, up to this point, that it's time for me to bring that love back to the Jewish people. We've lost that in the Galut. We talk about love of Torah, but how about the love of Eretz Yisrael? But what I want to highlight is the third aspect that the Baal Shem Tov speaks about of what it means to define a, a Jew or a chassid. It means to love your fellow person. And this is what Rav Kook, again, Rav Kook is devoted to this idea. He's dedicated to this idea of how do we love each other more. And he said the following. This is, I have a translation here from, this is from Igros Raya. I just thought it was a beautiful line. My beloved, this is Rav Kook writing in one of his letters. My beloved brothers, if only I had arms the size of the world so I could hug all of you with love. Yeah, it's a beautiful, I like to put that on a t-shirt. Like, it's a beautiful line. You know, if only my arms, I, I never heard another rabbi say it like this. Only my arms were large enough that I could hug everyone. I just want to hug. I, I walk the streets and I want to hug everyone. That's Rav Kook. Rav Kook, he learned it, but it, 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 was, it, was, who he, it was who he was. It was, it was his heart and soul. Uh, Rav Kook has notebooks that were, that were discovered. Actually, I just, <clears throat> I just saw that they're translating them for the first time. It's coming out in the next few weeks. Um, called the Shmona Kvatsin, which are notebooks where he just wrote, he wasn't really writing for publication, he was just writing, writing ideas. He did a lot of writing. He would, just, he would just write, write for hours. Whatever kind of was coming to mind, his heart, and he would write. Um, this is from the Shmona Kvatsin, and I have it in Hebrew, but for the sake of time, I just want to, let's just read it, read it in, uh, in English. And I think we can, again, I think we can think about this today in terms of our, in terms of how things have not changed dramatically from 100 years ago when he wrote this. Three forces struggle today in the Jewish people. Three forces struggle. This is a translation of the Hebrew above from Shemonik Vatzim. The holy, national, and humanistic. Interesting. Let's talk about that for a moment. We have a group that's the holy, right? Those that are, you can call them the religious community. You have the national Right, those that are nationalistic, those like for the country, patriotic, and then we have the humanistic. What do we have today? I think we have those three groups today. You have the, what we call the Haredi community, you have the Dati Lomi, the nationalists, and then you have the humanists, right? Then you have the, whatever, I, you're right. We don't want to use these words, right? But th that group as well. So though he identifies these three groups, which essentially we could talk about those three groups in Israel today. It would be tragic if these three camps that need to help each other and unite would entrench themselves in extremism, they must ultimately work together for there to be hope for the future. The separating of these drives results from their focusing on the shortcomings of the other two forces, right? Everybody likes to point fingers with all the problems that the other group has, the other faults, and not seeing the flaws in their own group. The three camps are known as the Orthodox who zealously and bitterly defend the Torah, mitzvot, and all that is holy in Israel, the new nationalists who fight for statehood, the liberals who speak for universal issues, it is obvious that in a healthy situation there is a need for all three of these forces. We must continually aspire for this state that the three forces harmoniously and beneficially function together, none of them taking up too much or too little space, clinging to each other with sublime love. That's, again, that's the... That's the Baal Shem Tov, that's, uh, that's the Chavetz Chaim, right? That's Rav Nachman of Breslov, loving each other, a deep love for one another, even where we disagree. The holy, the national, the universal, each recognizing the important role of the other. Beautiful. Okay. Coming to a close, we turn to page four. Now, there was a line that we opened with. There was a line that we opened with. Yes, please. This is Rav Kook. This is... Shmona Kavatsim, uh, yes, the writing of Rav Kook. Okay, great. Two more sources. So the opening line, 
for those that remember, going all the way back to the beginning of our, uh, of our shir, the opening line, Rav Kook made a statement which actually was a, is a, radical, a radical statement. I'm not even sure exactly how to interpret it. But Rav Kook said this harmony and this unity and this brotherhood can only happen, says Rav Kook, only in Avira of Eretz Yisrael, only in the land of Israel, that that unity is going to, is going to come about. Now, why, why is that? In other words, unity of Am Yisrael, brotherhood, why, why do you necessarily need Eretz Yisrael for that? That's something that, can we accomplish that, achieve that outside the land of Israel as well? Shouldn't that be the goal outside of Israel as well? And yet that's the statement that he made, right? That was the opening statement, that the, the first piece that we saw he says it's impossible. And actually, it sounds like he doesn't just say it'll happen in the land of Israel. What does he say? It's going to happen with the Avira de Eretz Israel. There's something about the spiritual quality of the land of Israel that that happens. Now, what does that mean? So I'll share with you the following. One interpretation. And this is one of going back to the influences of uh, those that influenced Rav Kook is the writing of the Maral of Prague. Another influence on Rav Kook, who is a mystic and uh, also in terms of the way he speaks about the land of Israel. This is from a book called Nativa Torah, Nativa Olam, where he speaks about Torah study and Torah study of the land of Israel. And he, this is a translation, word for word translation from the Hebrew of uh, of the Maral of Prague, who speaks about learning of Torah in the land of Israel. And we're just going to look at the, that, opening, that opening paragraph. Let's just, let me read it to you, or let's read it together. It is important to realize that these two characteristics of deference and sharpness. Now, deference means that we defer to one another, that there's a certain respect that we have for one another. That's something he's going to claim is unique to Eretz Israel. And sharpness, that we're kind of sharp with one another, a little bit critical. That's the quality outside the land of Israel. Are the indigenous characteristics, respectively, of Eretz Yisrael and Babylonia, of Babel. The Torah of the sacred Eretz Yisrael does not stray from the proper equilibrium and symmetry, as is true of men themselves in Eretz Yisrael, as we explained earlier. There's a certain symmetry. There's an equilibrium. There's a kind of a oneness that happens in the land of Israel, says the Maharal of Prague, which one does not find outside the land of Israel. Why is that? since this sacred land lies in the center of the world and therefore tends to align everything within it into the proper equilibrium and symmetry. I wish, I wish right? <laughs> so the Maral of Prague makes the following claim. Being in the center of the world physically, now what does that mean when we're on a globe that we're the center of the world? So that's a little bit of a, that's a challenging idea. But he says that this is the place of creation, that God began creation in, the, in this place. This is the center. We're right now sitting in the center. We're in the center of the world, of the globe. We're the center point. That center point brings about, again, spiritually, it brings about a certain balance. That balance, and again, that, he says that's going to, that affects relationships as well, that that's something that there's a balance, there's a, a respect, what he calls a deference, for one another that exists here in Israel that does not exist in the same way outside the land of Israel. And just reading to the end, Babylonia, on the other hand, is named because there is there, because there, sorry, because there did, sorry, is so named because there did Hashem confuse language of all the earth. Babel represents a kind of confusion, bilbul, which implies jumble and a lack of unity. Dialectic is thus more common there meaning like the, the way that one studies Gemara, that there's more, more, of, uh, more arguments and uh, complexities and difference of opinions. Since dialectics consist of one party attempting to refute the other, a relationship of opposition. So the Maral of Prague says the following, and he adds to this, and I'll add one other, one other piece. The Maral says, he says, number one, the placement of the land of Israel actually has an effect, a spiritual effect, on those that live in the land of Israel. And he also says the fact that Hashem that the eyes of Hashem are on the land of Israel, and that oneness of God affects the oneness in the land of Israel, the oneness in terms of creating harmony in the land of Israel. I believe that this is what Rav Kook is referring to, that only with Avira, the Eretz Israel, only once we're in that a atmosphere, that place of Israel, is the true unity going to be able to, uh, to unfold in Israel. 
Again, we can ask the question, we don't see it yet, but we believe that it's there. Rav Cook believes that it's there, Mel Rao believes that it's there, that that potential is there. Maybe we're seeing it, Bezrat Hashem, maybe we're seeing it, we're seeing it right now. Okay, I wanna end with the following, and, and again, the idea, and this has really been the idea of the entire shir, is the idea of Rav Cook's, the love that he has, and the idea of creating peace and creating harmony within Am Yisrael, and the importance of that on the, on the priorities of a Jew and what, and what we believe to be most important as, uh, as a people. We have Rashi. Rashi on the Torah says the following. Rashi, Rashi is our, we, we all know, is the great, the great commentary of the Torah. And I don't know if this is something that you ever took note of. I actually just saw this for the very first time recently that Rashi's comment, the very first comment on every book of the Torah, the way that he opens every book of the Torah, that there's one theme throughout. Now that's interesting, because you would think, well, it's a Pasuk in the Torah, there's something, you know, you have to address that Pasuk. There are other commentaries that have a introduction, where they, let's say the Ramban, the Ramban before he begins, Sefer Breshit, so he has an introduction, before Shemot he has an introduction. Rashi doesn't have an introduction, he has just, he begins his, as we all know, he just begins his commentary. So Rashi on the Torah, and we'll see it right now, Rashi on the Torah, every time he begins a new book of the Torah, there's one theme that he shares as, the, as you're about to begin the study of that book, and that is the love of Hashem for the people of Israel. So Breshit, the very first Rashi in Breshit says, why does it begin with the Breshit? Because the love that God has for the Jewish people, he wants to give Eretz Israel to the Jewish people, and therefore, he, makes, he, he begins with a statement that the entire world belongs to God, and I choose, says God, I choose who I'm going to give this land to. So the very first Rashi in Breshi talks about the love that God has for the Jewish people. Then Shemot, the very first Rashi in Shemot, speaks about what? The names, and it, the question is, why does God repeat the names again? And Rashi answers, because the chiba, because the love that God has for the Jewish people, so he repeats the names of the Shvatim a second time, even though we just had the names just uh, the previous parsha, Vayikra, Vayikra, the very first Rashi in Vayikra asked the question, what is the word Vayikra? And it says it's Lashon Chiba, it's a Lashon of love, the way that God addresses Moshe Rabbeinu, the, God, the way that God addresses his Nevi'im is with love, the love that he has for the Jewish people in contrast to others. We now go to the book of Bamidbar, and Bamidbar also asked the question in terms of enumerating why do we make a count again of the Jewish people where we already have the count? Rashi says, the first Rashi in Bamidbar, because God loves the Jewish people, he wants to count them again and again. Again, the word chiba. Actually, in, in, uh, in Shmod Vayikra and Bamidbar, the word chiba is used in all three of those Rashis. And then in Devarim, the first Rashi asked the question, as the question in terms of the, um, addresses the issue, or the question of the, the way that the, the, uh, the way that Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu gives rebuke to the Jewish people, and Rashi says he gives rebuke in a way that he doesn't say it outright, that he doesn't say it expressly, because the love that he had for the Jewish people. Interesting to note that Rashi, the way that he begins every book of the Torah, is all about love for Am Yisrael. And Rashi didn't necessarily have to do that. I believe that Rashi was, was, was presenting that as his opening statement as we're studying the Torah. Again, Rashi has in front of him, you know, the thousands of chazals and that he chose to, that, that he chose that idea to begin every book of the Torah about the chiba, the love that Hashem has for the Jewish people. There's a statement there that Rashi is, that, that, that Rashi is teaching us in terms of the importance of love. And this, just to end, this, this brings me to a, a, a final episode or, or story with, um, with Rav Ari Levin, who was the tzaddik of Yerushalayim. He was a, uh, a very, very close, a close, uh, close friend and to Rav Kook, a Talmud of Rav Kook. So at one point in his life, so Rav Ari Levin says to Rav Kook, how is it that you have so much love for Am Yisrael? I, I, I've never met a person that has the kind of love that you have for Am Yisrael. And Rav Kook said the following. It says in the Torah, it says that Hashem has love. The Pasuk is, Banim Atem La Hashem Elokeichem. God, when he speaks about the Jewish people, he says that they are my children. 
And Hashem speaks about Am Yisrael as if they're, you know, they're, they're the most beloved of his children. And Rav Kook says if that's true of Hashem, that Hashem treats every Jew as his child, so I also treat everyone as a, as a child, as a beloved, as a relative, as a family member. And v'halachta bidrachav, that I walk in the way of Hashem, that just as Hashem expresses his love, the chiba that Hashem has for, Am, for all of Am Yisrael, that I have that chiba as well. So this is the, uh, this is the lesson from Rav Kook today, uh, this morning, as we're studying together. Uh, the importance of uh, the priority of, of love, and I, I believe that this is, it's a world that Rav Kook is, is inspired by, of the Chafetz Chaim, of Nachman of Breslov, of Chabad, of this world that puts a great emphasis on that. And this is a teaching that, uh, that Rav Kook wants us to be inspired with today as well. Be'ezrat Hashem, I think we're seeing more and more of this with... Uh, as we are all, uh, that we're all aware of in terms of the, the difficulty and the challenges and the tragedy around the war, but, but a unity and a love and a respect that we're seeing amongst our people today is something that Bezrat Hashem we should continue to, um, to grow with and uh, continue to strengthen Am Yisrael with. Yashikoach.